Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, please open to Matthew 27. Uh, we're going to be starting in verse 11 today. Uh, there are Bibles in the back if you need one. Um, there's a myriad of apps on your phone that will have it. Uh, and if all else fails, it'll be right up on the screen. And that's where we will be. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, uh, so the Gospel of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, which is about two-thirds of the way through the Bible. So if you're unfamiliar with the layout of the Bible, that's, that's where we'll be. Uh, the big numbers are the chapters, and the little numbers are the verses. So we're going to be in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 27. Please stand for the reading of the word of God. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. They had then a notorious prisoner who was called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then having released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Father, as we gather today, as we gather to hear your word, I pray that you would afflict us in our comfort and comfort us in our affliction. Father, tune our hearts to hear your word, and I pray that your gospel would be made clear today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. So, I've titled the sermon today, What We Really Need. We're going to be looking today at different examples of the various actors in this scene, and they all are confronted with Jesus, they all meet Jesus, and they all, they all respond by clinging to what they think they need versus what they really need. And so the main idea, what I really want us to get out of this today is that we naturally choose our felt needs over our true need, but Jesus came to meet and to fulfill our true need. And so that's what we'll be, we'll be looking at today. And so before we, before we jump in, I just want to ask this question, what do you think you need? Like, so many times you might hear, I just, I really need, I really need a hamburger right now. Or, I really need whatever it is. Maybe you have a friend who's like, maybe he's just gotten out of a relationship and he meets a girl and he, he tells you, bro, I just, that girl, She's the one man, like, and you're sitting there going, I don't think so. But he's like, no, man, I, I really need this. It's like, no, you, you need time. You, need, you, don't, you don't need another girl right now. And so we often think, ask a kid what they really need, and they'll give you all sorts of answers, and it's not at all what they need. And so I want us to see today that we naturally choose what we think we need over our true need, and we often cling to that at the expense of, of Jesus. And we often choose those needs that we, think, that we think we need over Jesus. And so before we jump in, I want us to remember the context before we jump into verse 11. So remember, Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper. Uh, he, he has his, his disciples gathered together um, for the Passover, and he institutes communion, the sacrament of communion, so that we, um, so that his disciples and then all future generations of Christians until the Lord's return would remember his death, which, is he, which he's about to go to. 
we then see Jesus um, being faithful to the will of the Father. We see his, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if this cup can pass from me, please let it, nonetheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we see Jesus being faithful to the will of the Father, even when all his followers desert him and betray him. We then see Judas coming at the head of a crowd uh, to take Jesus under the cover of darkness. We then have this scene, we, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, where the chief priests have hastily gathered a trial under the cover of darkness so that they can find some, some sort of way to kill Jesus, to justify killing Jesus. We saw Peter deny his Savior three times, and we see him express godly grief and godly remorse, which leads to repentance. And in contrast, last week we saw Judas who displayed worldly remorse and worldly grief, and it does not lead to repentance. He felt bad for what he did, but it didn't lead him to repent. And so that's where we are now in verse 11. And so it says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. So... The chief priests gathered at night, this is at the end of chapter 26, and they they needed a reason to to justify killing Jesus. And now we've already seen that this trial did not conform to the normal proceedings and standards of what a trial had to be for it to be fair, for it to be a legal trial. None None of the rules were followed. In this regard, this is not meant to be a fair trial. It's meant to be a trial to get rid of Jesus as quickly as possible. And so they've done that in the middle of the night, and now they come before Pilate, and it's morning. So remember, the rooster has just crowed. Peter has just denied Jesus. It's about six in the morning right now, um, roughly. And they, they come clamoring to the governor, um, to Pilate. And the reason they have to come to Pilate is that they need Rome to kill Jesus. They can't, under, under Roman occupation, the Jews are not allowed to execute capital punishment. And so they need Rome to kill Jesus. Um, But the charge of blasphemy is not enough. Pilate's not going to care if they say, well, Jesus blasphemed the name of our God. Pilate's going to go, I don't care. And that's not enough for, that's not even enough for me to punish him. He he won't care. So the Pharisees, they've got their, their kind of religious reason. And this is probably what they would use later when they're persuading the crowds to kill Jesus. They have their, their blasphemy charge, but now they need to, to shape this and couch it in such a way that Rome will go for it and that they can get Rome on board um, for killing Jesus. And so they focus their accusation against Jesus being the king of the Jews. And Jesus, Jesus answers Pilate's question much like he answers the chief priests a few verses prior. He says, yes, I am the king of the Jews, but he says it in such a way that communicates it's not. He, he's defining that in his own terms. But Pilate, under pressure from the chief priests and elders, he, he lets himself be persuaded. So the Gospel of John provides some clarity. Uh, he provides some clarity on what exactly the chief priests and the elders were, were saying and were doing that would push Pilate to go for the execution of Jesus. Um, in John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 12, Um, It says, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. From then on just refers to, he and Jesus have been having a conversation. It's becoming more and more clear to Pilate that Jesus not only is innocent, but is also not even just fully human, that he's also the son of God. And so it says, from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And that's how they push Pilate to kill Jesus. And so we'll come back to Pilate. Um, I want to first look at the, the Pharisees' uh, response to Jesus. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to, to Pilate in a little bit. So the Pharisees had many opportunities to respond to Jesus. They've, they'd had three years of, of, of public ministry. They'd, they'd seen all sorts of miracles and testimonies. And they'd, they'd seen all sorts of things. And Jesus, Jesus was a challenge to them. The Pharisees, their, their, their felt need, what they really felt they needed was liberation from Rome and was their political and their social standing and power. And Jesus warns his disciples against that. He tells them, be careful. Do not be like the hypocrites. 
like the Pharisees and the scribes, because they love to make long prayers. They love, they love to be dressed up. They love the places of honor at feasts. They love, they love the honor that comes from man rather than the honor that comes from God. And that's what they clung to. That's what they loved. And Jesus was a threat to that because Jesus came and Jesus came to be on the throne of their lives. He came to put God on the throne of their lives, but really they were on the throne of their lives. And so Jesus warned his disciples about that, to not be like the hypocrites, to not be like whitewashed tombs, as he at one point calls the Pharisees. And so Jesus is a threat to our earthly kingdoms. It's quite easy for us perhaps to, to start to get into you know, we follow God and we follow Jesus, but we maybe follow him in as much as he fits our plans. And so, like the Pharisees, the Pharisees were blind to what the scriptures that they knew foretold because they were using the scriptures for their own personal gain. They were using the law as a way to justify their own, their own status. They would hold it over people as a way of justifying their own, their own earthly status. Jesus tells Pilate, this is recorded in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world, but maybe we act like God's kingdom is of this world sometimes, and maybe we act like God's kingdom is our kingdom, and so as long as my job's going well, my family's doing all right, all, whatever it might be, sometimes we act like that's God's highest priority and not, we forget that we are ambassadors, we forget that we're sent or sent by God to proclaim the good news. And the Pharisees had ample opportunities to submit to God and to repent, but they didn't. They chose an earthly kingdom instead of a heavenly one. And this is evidence, this is, this is case in point in their choice of Barabbas. So Barabbas is called a notorious prisoner. Um, we, if you read in your footnotes and, and in the other gospels as well, we see that Barabbas was an insurrectionist. The province of Judea was one of the most troublesome provinces under the Roman Empire. Uh, there were constant revolts um, and uprisings in an attempt to throw off the power of Rome and the control of Rome from this province. And Barabbas was one such man. He was, he's called an insurrectionist. And he represents an earthly kingdom. He represents in a lot of ways what the Jews were looking for in their Messiah. They were looking for someone who would restore the kingdom of David, who would restore Israel as it had been under David and Solomon when they were the, the, the political and the military and the social power of the region, not under occupation from anyone. And the Pharisees choose Barabbas. They choose, they choose the earthly kingdom over the heavenly kingdom. And they're not under any illusions as to who G Jesus is. Jesus is... It's not like they made this choice of like, well, we weren't really sure and it just seemed like this was the safer option to go. They knew exactly who Jesus was. They'd seen, they had all sorts of evidence. But they choose the earthly kingdom over the heavenly one. They chose their, their felt need over their real one. And they stir up the people to choose Barabbas over Jesus. It says in verse 20, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The people here are not innocent either, though. They know who Jesus is. They've seen, they've heard his, his sermons. They've, they were, perhaps they were there for the Sermon on the Mountain. Uh, they've heard his sermons. They've, heard his good, they've seen his good works and his deeds. He's heard uh, them, him say to them, you shall love your enemies as yourself. I say to you, do not hate the one who persecutes you, but rather pray for him, bless him. They've seen all that. They've heard all that. But here they are, demanding his blood, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And when Pilate asks them, they don't even have a good answer. They just keep yelling, crucify him. Pilate asks, what evil has Christ done? And nobody gives him an answer. He's just told to crucify them. And so what, is this, what does this mean for us, this, this response of the Pharisees and whatnot? Are we focused on our own earthly kingdom, our own earthly progress, or are we concerned with godly kingdom building? God is, 
God wants to be on the throne of our lives. God should be on the throne of our lives. God should be what we prioritize. We fix our eyes on the things that are above and not the things that are below on earth. And while there are lots of good things to do on earth, we never want those to become the priority. We never want those to become our God. For the Pharisees, their law-keeping was, was their God. And so when the Messiah came, they killed him. They delivered him over to Rome because he went against what they, what they worshipped and what made them feel like they felt that's what they needed most, was to feel this feeling of acceptance from the people around them, from this rule-keeping. And so I want to challenge us. I want us to think through how do we do that. It might be easy for us to say, well, we would never kill Jesus. We wouldn't, we wouldn't turn him over to Rome. Um, but we do, we do this in subtle ways, in heart ways. And God commands heart postures. God doesn't just command physical acts and deeds. He also commands heart postures. And so I want us to examine ourselves, that we not be like the Pharisees. And I know that's probably, you probably hear hear that a lot. Don't be like the Pharisees. Be like Jesus. But in this case, I want us to examine our heart and actually examine our heart as does our heart lean towards our felt earthly needs? Or does our heart rest on the fact that our deepest need has been met? And we also see Pilate, like the Pharisees, clings to his career and his political position at the expense of Jesus. Pilate also knew he would have heard plenty about Jesus um, all throughout Jesus' ministry. He's the governor of a province. And Jesus did a lot, of, a lot of big things, a lot of miracles. Pilate would have heard about Jesus. He would have known. And we get this perhaps a little more clearly in the other Gospels, but Pilate knows very quickly that Jesus is innocent. And he knows that Jesus is the Son of God, as we saw earlier in John. Um, in Luke's Gospel, uh, Pilate tells the crowd that both he and Herod have found Jesus to be innocent and not deserving of death. And moreover, in verse 18 of our text, it says that he, Pilate, knew that it was out of envy that they, the chief priests and elders, had delivered Jesus up. He knows why. He perceives that this is not genuine. This is not a real fair trial. These are not actually grounds for killing someone, much less crucifying someone. He knows that the chief priests and elders are jealous of Jesus' popularity and status with the people. In addition, Pilate also gets further confirmation from God that Jesus is innocent. His wife, in verse 19, while Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. God gives Pilate further warning and confirmation. The Romans took dreams seriously. Dreams were considered omens. They took dreams very seriously. And so this is yet another mercy of God, even towards Pilate, giving him one more reason to understand and to know that Jesus is innocent. But Pilate ultimately sides with the crowd. He allows himself to be persuaded to release Barabbas and to kill Jesus because he fears, he fears man and he fears the prospect of giving up his career and giving up his political position. When the Jews cry out to him in John, we have uh, anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar and if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. That's what, that pushes Pilate over the edge. At that point, being faced with the wrath of Caesar is more terrifying to him than being faced with the wrath of God. And so, in verse 24, it says, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. So not only does Pilate fear man, not only does he decide that man's opinion matters more than doing what's right, ultimately that man's opinion matters more than what God thinks. But he also tries to abdicate his responsibility. He tries to off-shift his blame and his culpability in this situation off to the people. His symbolic gesture of washing his hands and saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood, 
your notes, by the way, under your Bible might say, um, I am innocent of this man's righteous blood. Some manuscripts add that clarification, further solidifying that everybody knows that Jesus is innocent. Nobody's under any illusions right now as to whether or not this is just. At this point, they're just deciding what to do with Jesus. Pilate is the governor of a Roman province. Whether he knows it by, or not, he's been given that authority by God, and Jesus tells him that in the Gospel of John. He doesn't get to just abdicate his responsibility. He doesn't get to just off-shift the blame. It doesn't matter what the, what the mob, it doesn't matter that a, that a riot is forming. He doesn't get to off-shift responsibility. He doesn't get to off-shift blame. The phrase, see to it yourselves, that he uses as, as his final attempt of like, it's not on me, it's on you, and he tries to back away from it. That also mirrors the Pharisees' response to Judas when Judas comes running in, realizing that what he's done, realizing that he's betrayed Jesus. And he throws the silver on the floor and he says, I've sinned, I've betrayed innocent blood. And the Pharisees look at him and say, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Again, saying, well, that's your fault. We're just, we're doing what we need to do, but they don't get to off shift blame either. And so for us, what, is this, what does this look like? How do we off shift our responsibilities? By the way, man, and when I say man, I mean mankind, has been trying to, uh, we've been trying to deflect blame since the Garden of Eden. God, the woman you gave me, offered me this fruit and I ate it. God, the serpent you made, tempted me and I ate. We've been trying to deflect blame since the beginning. And so how does this apply to us? Are we more concerned with the fear of man than with the fear of God? Are we more concerned with what other people think of us than we are with serving God? Pilate, under pressure, caves and balks at his responsibility. He lets the fear of man cause him to try to step out from under the umbrella of responsibility that he has. And we do this too. We all do this. <laughs> I do this. We all try to look for reasons why we're not at fault or why we haven't why maybe it's someone else's job. And so what are some of our obligations and responsibilities? We can probably name the big ones. We have jobs, families, those are the big ones. What about us as Christians in here though? What are our responsibilities to one another? We know for example that if we see our brother and sister in sin, we ought to rebuke them. But we also have an obligation to love them. And so do we walk up to them, hit them over the head with the Bible and say repent and then just walk away having done our duty? Or do we actually take the time to understand what's happening in their lives? To yes, call them out, to rebuke them. Don't, don't shirk that responsibility either. Some of us go the other way and like, well, it's not that bad. God will, God will convict them, they'll figure it out. That's the side I err on too much. I'm much more likely to go, well, I'm just gonna love them, I'll pray with them. And then, you know, slowly but surely, we'll, we'll work with them. And that's an application of responsibility as well. When we see our brother and sister in sin, we go and rebuke them in love. Even if they're not in sin, do we even, we have responsibilities to each other as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Do we know one another? Do we love one another? Are we showing hospitality to one another? Are we serving each other? We know what's going on in each other's lives. If we just show up to church on Sunday but don't know the people around us, then we're not fulfilling obligations and responsibilities that God has commanded us. God has told us to love one another. An interesting, interesting and convicting study, which we don't have time to go into right now, so I won't, but for your own personal devotions, if you want, if you want to use this, a study of the one another's throughout the New Testament is illuminating and convicting, and there's a lot of them. What 
we're all guilty of not doing what we should be doing. Sin is not just what we do, it's also what we don't do. And so we need to repent. We need to change our heart posture and our behavior. And we can do that because of what Jesus does in this scene. In the midst of all this chaos, you have the chief priests and the elders who are, you know, they probably aren't even making sense half the time. Just like, Pilate, you got to kill this guy. Like, he blasphemed. He's a king. He doesn't like Caesar. Like, he's got that. Pilate's trying to make sense of that. You have the crowd stirred up by the chief priests, just yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Just imagine this. It's also six in the morning. I imagine this is a really chaotic morning scene. And Pilate's trying to make sense of all this. His wife warns him, says, hey, I've had a dream. Jesus is righteous. Don't do this. He can't even get a straight answer, but he can see that a riot is beginning. And in the midst of all that, all this chaos, stands Jesus, and he's silent. He's the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, and he stands there, just silent, obedient and faithful to the will of the Father. Like we saw a couple weeks ago, Jesus does not dignify the false accusations with, with an answer. We see that in verse 12. He already knows, I mean, the trial's a sham. It's not fair. It's not even, the accusations aren't even true. And he knows that. But he also knows that it's the will of God that he be here and that he go forth to die for our sins. And so in contrast to the people, in contrast to the Pharisees, and in contrast to every, all the chaos that is going on around him, we see Jesus concerned with the kingdom of God and not his own kingdom, and not his own will. We see Jesus not abdicating his responsibilities, and he's under extreme pressure. Like, he knows what he's walking into. But we see him not abdicate that. We see him, for the joy that was set before him, going to endure the cross and despising the shame. And Jesus is faithful where we, where we are not faithful. There's a couple points of, of irony in here. Probably the most chilling verse of this entire section is when the people, in verse 25, all the people answered after Pilate's symbolic gesture. All the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Let that sink in for a minute. Like, not only are they accepting responsibility for innocent blood, but they're also indicting their children in this. And the irony of this is that Jesus' blood will be on them in a few weeks, but it's going to be covering them and it's going to be saving them. Because if we read in Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, Peter stands up and delivers a sermon accusing the Jews, accusing the Jewish nation of crucifying Jesus. And Luke writes that when Peter gets to the end of his sermon, that their hearts were cut, that they just, they got hit with the weight of what they had done. And they asked the apostles, what must we do? And some of them repent. And of course, not, a, not everyone in the crowd repents. Some of them did wind up with the blood of Jesus on them. But the irony is that, and the mercy of the Father is that even those who are responsible for the death of Jesus, who are accepting responsibility and blame for it, God was still being gracious and merciful to them. Another point is that Barabbas, his name means son of the father. It can be broken into two. Bar, which in Hebrew is son, and Abba. You may remember from, from Romans 8, where we can cry, Abba, Father. We don't have a spirit of slavery to fall back into sin, but we have a spirit of adoption. There are three crosses prepared. The, the two thieves that Jesus is crucified next to were probably also insurrectionists and friends of Barabbas and co-workers, as it were. But Jesus takes his place. Jesus takes the place of 
this insurrectionist so that he can truly be the son of the father. And we don't know what Barabbas did after this. Um, there's, no other, there's no other mention or record of him either in the Bible or outside of it after this. This is our only mention of him. So we don't know what happened. But Jesus is going to the cross so that we can be sons and daughters of God. And so Jesus is the example of success in this scene. It may seem like not because he's going to go be crucified. Pilate scourges him, which was not just a regular beating. That was a, that was a, really, brutal, a really brutal whip. And they had no limits on how much they would beat you. Under Jewish law, they couldn't give you more than 39 lashes, I believe. But the Romans didn't have any such qualms. And so even though Jesus is being falsely accused and he's being sentenced to the most horrific death imaginable, Jesus is walking faithfully and obediently, and this is our example. This is the story of success. And we all, it's maybe easy to not see ourselves too much in this. In this story, we go, well, we're not the crowd, we're not, no. But we are. We've chosen our own desires in our own kingdom over God, and yet Jesus has still forgiven us. For those of us who have repented, Jesus has met our deepest, deepest need. If you're not a Christian in here, what do you think is your deepest need? What is the thing, the one thing if you had would make you feel like your life, everything was good in your life, everything was all right, everything was, got my ducks in a row, we're good to go. What's the one thing that would give you that? I promise that even if you have it, it won't, it won't satisfy you. It doesn't meet your true deepest need, which is that you need a savior. We all of us need a savior in here. We have a disease, and it's called sin. And that sin causes us to have heart postures that put ourselves on the throne, we, we are much quicker to take care of our own, what we think we need, as opposed to serving God. But God has met our deepest need. Jesus is staying the course here to meet our deepest need. Jesus lived humbly and in obscurity. He was a carpenter from Galilee, but he lived the life we couldn't live he died the life that we should, or died the death that we should have died. We don't have to fear what man thinks of us because God's already redeemed us. He saved us. We've been declared children of God. Why do we care what anyone else thinks? We can live and walk in the and walk in the good works that God has placed before us because of what Jesus has done. We can have heart postures that are pleasing to God because of what Jesus has done. When we fail to fulfill our responsibilities, there's grace. And when we prioritize the wrong things, there's grace. Our deepest need has been met and we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, not in judgment, but in mercy and in grace. We ought not to act like the Pharisees or like Pilate. But when we do sometimes act like them, there is grace abounding for all of us, all of us who have repented and who are in Christ Jesus, because Jesus succeeded where we failed. And that's why we celebrate communion every week. And it is a celebration. It's a memorial, but it is a celebration, because we know the end of the story, and we know that we are no longer under condemnation. And so all of us, all of us who have repented and who are in Christ Jesus, we can partake of this. And we do this until the Lord comes back. And so I'm going to pray for us. The worship team can come up. Um, they'll lead us in a song. Um, and during that song, I encourage you all to sit and think and think through. Let the Holy Spirit highlight any areas that have not been surrendered to him any areas of responsibility that maybe you're failing in, areas of priority where you're 
not prioritizing kingdom-minded things. Take some time to reflect and then come and take a, take a piece of bread and take a cup of juice. And then after when the song is over, I'll, I'll lead us in that. If you're not a Christian in here, please do not partake. Um, this is for Christians. This is for people who have understood what it is that they're celebrating. And if you, if you eat and drink in a manner unworthy, that is, if you, you don't believe, you don't understand what you're doing, then Paul warns that we drink judgment on ourselves if we do this in an unworthy manner. So please, if you're not a Christian in here, please abstain. There's no judgment from us. Nobody's going to be keeping track of who did what. And so, yeah. I'm going to pray for us. And then I urge you to take some time and reflect. Father God, thank you that you have met our deepest need. Father, thank you that you have come to this earth. And Father, you didn't just show up right at the end of 33 years, ready to die, and and then called it good. Father, you actually came and lived and shared our experiences. You lived in obscurity for 30 years as a, a poor man in Galilee in the first century. Father, thank you that you did not abdicate your responsibilities. Thank you that Jesus stayed the course. Thank you that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us and with our weaknesses, and a high priest who did everything that we couldn't do. And Father, thank you for the gift that we do not deserve, where we, Father, we get to be declared righteous before you. Father, we don't deserve that. We didn't, we didn't earn that. We didn't do that. That was you. That was Jesus. And so, Father, thank you. Father, I pray now as we go into a time of worship and reflection, I pray that you would Father, highlight in our hearts any areas that we need to repent of, Father, any areas where we are failing to prioritize you, any areas of responsibility, Father, that we are failing in. Father, I know we all have them. And so, Father, please highlight them. And Father, I pray that we would repent. And Father, thank you that we can be refreshed by your grace and your mercy towards us. And it's in your name we pray.